those of you who have seen my presentation before will know that Richard Audison and I have been working on a series of RPN calculators of our own design. Rich and I work for the very big corporation of America, or BBCA, and you may have seen in the press there's been a big management shakeup at the BBCA, and we're not exactly sure what's going to happen to our calculators. We're hoping that, the calcul we're hoping that our calculator division uh, will we'll move over to the rubber chicken division. So, Which is part of frozen foods. Yes, yes. All right, so the, Richard, Rich and I started this project about uh, well, more than 10 years ago, and at the time, that was one of the times that the future of HP calculators looked a little iffy. And also, uh, you know, we were heavily interested in the high-end traditional RPN calculators like the 41, and of course the 41 had been discontinued some years before that. And since it wasn't clear that HP would be making any, any more comparable things, we decided that, that we should just do it ourselves. So, oh, oh this is this is an actual HP, so you, you all have seen these. There we go. Um, so I don't need to say too much more about that right now. That's much better. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Sorry, I'm focused here. Slide the paper to the I can count the germs on the screen. Slide the paper to the right. Convert to transparent modes. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's good. calculator so, about five degrees. Yeah. So, anyhow, you've all seen HP 41s. This is a perfectly ordinary HP 41, so nothing more needs to be said about that. So, we did a we made a series of, of other calculators. This is this is this is one of them. Um, we Rich called called them the DIY RPM calculators uh, since we were doing it ourselves. And so this this one and I, I didn't bring some of the earliest ones. And this this one are, are a couple of prototypes that we made. And using di we were experimenting with using different uh, sorts of case technologies. Like this this one is a, a 3D printed case. And uh, we'll talk more about cases later. And those calculators used a microchip PIC microprocessor, which is an 8-bit processor that um, is not especially brisk. And so what we discovered is that that was okay for simulating an HP 25 or calculators of that era, but it wasn't really going to have any CPU performance to simulate a 41 at 41 speed. I really would like more than 41 speed. And so we set out to evaluate different processors we could use, and our, our selection criteria, I also didn't want to write the software in assembly language, and so we wanted a 32-bit processor that could efficiently execute C code, and we wanted that processor to be low power, which at the time we set out, there weren't any low power 32-bit processors, um, and over time, some started to appear. Um, and we wanted to have reasonable memory size of both flash and RAM to support all those sorts of calculator stuff we wanted to do. So when HP redid the 12C, they used this Atmel AT91 SAM 7L128 chip. So that's what's in the 12C, the, 15, the new 15C, the 10B2+, plus, the 20B, and the 30B. And of course, that's what is used in the, in the WP34S um, in terms of uh, that's based on the 20B or 30B. And that chip is very low power, but it has some drawbacks. Um, it only has 6K bytes of RAM, and only 2K bytes of that is battery backed. And so that's not sufficient for a 41. And there weren't any other really low power ARM chips at that time, uh, but in early 2010, or maybe late 2009, a new company called Energy Micro announced uh, a system on chip, a sort of a microcontroller called the EFM32 Gecko. And it's a company in, um, in Norway, so that's where the title of my talk, uh, Scale Reptiles of the Nordic Countries, comes from. Um, I'm sorry? Geckos have scale? Yes. Oh, they do. Yeah. And so the, um, I believe so. Um, so this chip uses an, an ARM Cortex M3 core, which is a newer ARM core than, than, the, uh, than the one in the Atmel part. Um, it's very low power. They, they claimed it was 180 microamps per megahertz, which uh, is extremely low current. So it was actually, you know, one of those sorts of things that, that I had a hard time even believing the claim when I saw the marketing literature. It has four low power modes. 128K of flash, same as the Atmel part, but it has 16K bytes of RAM, which is all battery backed. So eight times as much battery backed RAM. Um, it has various uh, various oscillators, internal RC oscillators, external crystal oscillators. I don't need to go into the detail on that. But being that it was a new company with no track record, we were somewhat concerned about about whether this was really going to be viable, whether they were you know really going to ship the product, whether we'd be able to get it, whether it would perform as well as they as they. Uh, claimed it would, and 
you know, given that they're in Norway, would they maybe be more difficult to deal with than a U.S.-based company? Um, however, the founders of, of um, Energy Micro uh, were previously the founders of a company called ChipCon that made radio chips, and Texas Instruments acquired them. That product, product line has been very successful, so that suggests that these people at Energy Micro probably really do, do know what they're doing. So in May 2010, I got a development kit from them um, and wrote some sample test programs to try to verify their claims about the low power, and sure enough, the power was basically very close to what they claimed, and that made it eminently suitable for a calculator. Um, now another, another thing, so, so Rich actually made a, a printed circuit board uh, using this chip, and I actually, dem I actually showed that prototype last year but it was not, we didn't have calculator firmware for it, so it was only running a hardware test program, so it wasn't very interesting. Um, all these calculators, like uh, all, all these prototypes we've done, use a character LCD module. Actually, I should use this one because it actually will power up. Um, and so one of the, there's, there's several limitations due to that character LCD module. All right, well, I guess it took the battery out. Um, <laughs> But there were various reasons why using a character LCD module was, was not really well suited to a 41. Um, and so we were, looking, we were looking for a graphic LCD that we could use. And one of the problems we faced is finding any LCD that's the right width for a calculator, which is a little bit over two inches wide, is difficult because none of, almost none of the standard LCDs are that size. They're all either very narrow or very much wider than that. Presumably, the LCD manufacturers aren't expecting to sell to calculators, you know, to companies that want to make calculators because those companies have custom LCDs made. So a couple months ago, we heard about a new a new graphic LCD display, which I'm going to show you in a moment, from, from Sharp Microelectronics called a memory LCD. And it's a new technology. It's like a it's like a thin film transistor uh, active matrix LCD, except that in a normal TFT display, there is one thin film transistor per pixel, and it's just used as a switch to, uh, to scan the display. In the memory LCD, it's thin film transistors, but they have multiple transistors per pixel, and they actually have a flip-flop or a one bit of memory in the display for each pixel. That means you send data to the display, and it remembers that data, and you don't have to do any refreshing. And so, what's that? Did you read it back? You cannot read it back. I'll get to that. Um, so the... Um, the advantage of this display is it's very low power, but also they happened to make one that was the right width for a calculator. It's, it's a 2.7 inch diagonal. So uh, without too much further ado, I will break it out and show you. Don't break it. Is that camera? Switch off. Don't worry about status discharge or anything. Run roll? It's not an SR60. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Right on the camera. So, so, so. Camera. There you go. Okay, wow. All right. All right. So, so this prototype is in a folded acrylic case, and so you see the nice big display there. The um, the keyboard portion is approximately proportioned the same as a 41. So, the the big display makes it longer than a 41, and I'll I'll just hold it up here. Um, you can, you'll be able to see that it is taller than a 41 and maybe approximately the same height as a 41 with a card reader, roughly speaking. Mm -hmm. So in general, we wanted to make a calculator smaller rather than larger, but we decided that with the nice display that maybe it was a reasonable trade-off to, to actually have it be longer. And so I'll turn it on here. Um, and I'll turn it to the right orientation so you can see it. And the other, the other characteristic of so much glare there. Um, other side. Other side. There we go. Um, the other characteristic of the display is it's very high resolution. This is a 400 pixel wide by 240 pixel tall display. It's 173 dots per inch. And so therefore, because of that, I can use a fairly, I can use some fairly nice fonts. And what I did was basically uh, render some fonts uh, from uh, from a uh, personal computer in the right uh, sizes to use on this. So there you see just basically the X register of the stack. I can turn on, I can turn, well, I, there's alpha, I have nothing in the alpha register, but uh, I'm gonna put it in program mode, turn on a few of the enunciators. And th so those enunciators, this display does not have dedicated enunciators. So those enunciators are actually being displayed as bitmaps. So that was nice that I could actually display 
high quality enunciators out of out of the bitmap display. Um, so uh, there's there's the clock mode. I, I, this is emulating a 41CX. I just I only just got the clock mode working a couple days ago. Uh, let's go back to uh, the normal display here. The uh, keyboard debounce um, uh, needs needs some work. It's not yet, not yet real good. But anyhow, so we've got all this extra display space up here above above the X register, and we were just we're just we cannot figure out for the life of us what that would be useful for. So, <laughs> oh, what, the stack. Well, let's let's see here. What, now, what happen, What happens here? Let's see. Let's do a function. There's a set flag, and we'll try. Now, of course, on a 41, you can't set flags above 30, so this is a bit of a problem, maybe. But let's just see what happens here. Set flag 56. And well, evidently that must wow. be the stack. So actually, uh, we we uh, found. In our own testing, just the two of us, that having the full stack displayed was useful sometimes, and it was just a distraction other times. So I wanted to make it switchable, and you know I wanted to use a flag to do that. But all the 41 flags uh, either are already spoken for, or they're general purpose flags that you might use in your own program. So we decided, well, we just need to have some extra flags. So we now have 256 flags instead of <laughs> instead of 56. And, and, uh, the flags above 55. Um, there's no limitation that they can't be set. You know that they can't be manually set and cleared like there are for 30 through 55. Um, the ones above 99 you can only access indirectly. Um, but anyhow, so we so we've got that. And I'm going to show. Uh, now the other thing about this. Okay, so this this chip can run different frequencies. We're using prime. We're using an external uh, crystal, a low frequency crystal, to do the timekeeping functions. But all the pro all the processing is being done on an internal RC uh, uh, clock, which, as you as you may know, is not as precise as a crystal. But we don't really need it to be especially precise since that one's not used for the timekeeping. And we have various choices available. We've chosen at the moment to run this at 14 megahertz. Um, the part can go up to 32 with an external clock. There's a 28 megahertz internal RC we could use. Um, but when you go over 16 megahertz, you have to enable a wait state on the on the flash memory. And Cyril talked about that earlier uh, with regard with regard to a different calculator, and pointed out that, that when you have to put in a wait state, then doubling the clock speed maybe only gets you about 50% more performance. And that's what we found. So um, probably we'll put in a function to let the user choose which clock they want. Right now, right now we don't have that. Um, so I'm going to actually run a program here, and I guess I will bring back the original 41 briefly, and. Run the program. Turn it on. Okay, and this is this is a version of a of a common eight Queens benchmark that has been modified to display uh, some of the intermediate uh, uh, work that it's doing. And so I'll run that, and you'll see the goose, you know, flies across there a little bit. And then we get an answer, and a little bit later we get another. Well, it's not an answer, but it's made an intermediate step, and we get another and another, and so on. And so I'll run the same thing here. I'm going to go ahead and turn that stack display off. And I'm going to go ahead and, and run this. Return, run it. And you see it's a little bit faster. Um, what, what we found is that, it, it, like, like was said in the, in the uh, talk about the 15C timing, that how much faster it is depends a great deal on exactly which instructions the program is using. So what I basically found is running at 14 megahertz, we get somewhere between 6 and 15 times the original performance. Now you should bear in mind though that unlike the 15 where Cyril did a lot of good work to speed it up, this is running very crude and unoptimized simulation code. So I believe that actually with some work applied to optimizing it, it can be made to run much faster than this. Um, Check my outline here and see what, I'm, what else I'm supposed to say. Um, so the display, I, I said it was very low power. Um, the specification uh, from Sharp is that it draws 50 microwatts power while it's idle. It has, it has a static display. And it requires a 5 volt uh, power supply, which you know you think these days, you know, I mean, 5 volt used to be a standard common uh, uh, power supply voltage that was used by a lot of logic chips. And everything has moved to three volts now, and so you won't, well, why would the display use five volts? And uh, you know, evidently, evidently they need it. And so what that means for us, the calculator actually runs on 3.1 volts when it's powered up, and so we had to put in a, uh, a charge pump to uh, boost that to, to five volts, and that, that turns out.
to increase the power dissipation to about 250 microwatts. So the charge pump is actually drawing four times as much power as the display. Um, but for comparison, I mentioned the one of the problems with the character LCD is it draws a lot of power. Um, we're spending 250 microwatts on, on this display, including the charge pump, but our character display that that replaced was drawing 4,500 microwatts, or 4.5 milliwatts. So it's a huge improvement. The uh, interface to the display is, is serial. It's an SPI interface running it up to 2 megahertz. It's you know, 2 million pixels you can shift into it per second, not, not counting some overhead. But there, it does have some limitations. So you, you may have seen chip on glass displays where you have a piece of glass and it has a flex circuit tail hanging off of it and, there, and there's a chip somewhere in there. And this doesn't have the chip. This is all in the thin film display. Um, and they obviously wanted to not put any more transistors in that than they had to for various reasons. And so you can only, you can't, you can only update one entire row of the display at a time. If you want to change three pixels in the middle, you have to send out the whole row that those pixels are in. And you also, uh, as, as was alluded to earlier, you can't read it back. And because of the number of pixels and the relatively slow speed of the interface, if you wanted to do full screen updates, you can only do those at about 20 hertz. So it wouldn't be good for doing full screen animation. It also has no support. There's no, there's no real way to do grayscale. Um, you can maybe do frame alternating grayscale, but again, you know, at 20 hertz, it, it, it would look terrible. Uh, if you wanted to animate, if you want to do grayscale on just a tiny portion of the screen, maybe that might be possible. Basically, we're not going to try to do grayscale. Um, the display cannot, cannot be read back, which has the interesting consequence that the software can't even tell if the display is working or if it's even attached. Normally, we expect, oh, we can, we can do some sort of self-test and it, you know, it, would, it would be able to detect if the display has failed. We, we cannot do that with this display. Um, I, talked, I talked about the fonts. Fonts are stored as bitmaps. We have three sizes. You can see two there. You can see the, you know, the main display, which I'll put it back in a different mode here, uh, is uh, nice big characters. Those happen to be uh, about, uh, the character cell width is 32 pixels, but I think they're about, the character cell is about 29 pixels tall. And one of the things that we, one of the benefits we get from the graphic display that we didn't have on the character display is that like the original 41, we can put the punctuation, a period, a comma, or a colon between characters. The character display has caused a big problem because they had to take up a whole character space, and that meant, that meant that scrolling the alpha display didn't work right when you had a lot of punctuation in it and various other problems, so that's all fixed. Um, and... Personally, I think the, the, the font looks uh, looks fairly nice. Um, and you see the keyboard debounce is not working great. Even even the you know the lowercase, which we have the full lowercase character set in here, but I haven't yet patched the firmware uh, to use it. Um, um, and I did have to add some characters to the font to to get some of the 41 characters that weren't natively in the font, like the. Uh, those are, but uh, where's, there we go. The angle symbol, which I didn't do a very good job of. Um, we do not have Chinese, so we 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 probably point. Yeah, well, it, had, it, had, it had not actually occurred to us to try to sell this in China, so um, we may have to add that to, to the list. Um, and in in print, enter that in the display. Hit enter three times. To do what? No, it's alpha register. Well, this, this is just the... No, no, no. Um, one of the things we thought about doing, but I didn't have time to do uh, before, before the conference here, is we could put in a 14-segment uh, font to make it look like a 41 display. <laughs> and in principle, we could support you know, user-supplied fonts. You could download them into it if you wanted it to look different. Um, uh, hey, well, does it uh, emulate uh, synthetic programming? It does. It it is. So you, you uh, could, could you could you like? We, we need an update to Bill Wicks's Hangman program. Get all the space. You know, I, a big giant guy up there hanging. Um, <laughs> I haven't yet. I haven't yet added all the Hangman characters to the font. It's, you know, I mean, there's the original 41 character set had 80 different displayable characters, and the Half Nut added a few more. And I, I've got some of those, but not all of them in there yet. That's cool. Um, so where's the goose? Oh well, the, the, the goose is there. For for, for instance, one one way to, I, I showed it when when I ran a program, but the other the other way to see it is uh, I can 
Apple Golf mode and execute. So you can make it fly back. The, you got some fun. Yeah, if it, yeah, you could. I haven't put in the program to do that. Uh, let me execute um, stopwatch, and uh, the stopwatch uses the goose as an indicator. Um, so um, the uh, so so I'm going to talk a little bit about the software development. Uh, the development tools we used was not my first choice, but we used uh, the IAR uh, Kickstart um, ARM compiler, IDE, linker, debugger, etc. Um, which the Kickstart version is uh, limited to 32k bytes of code, uh, but it's a it's a free download, uh, so that was very convenient. And the demo programs that Energy Micro supplied were. Uh, compiled with several different compilers. That was one of them. So we started with that. We'll probably switch to a different compiler at some point. We are. Probably the other compilers. I'm sorry. Probably the other compilers that they provided demos for. Uh, they provided uh, demos for uh, GCC and for the uh, ARM compiler. That I can't think of the name of it. Code it no, one Code Warrior. It was uh, they. They have some high-end compiler that they sell. Probably the Kaya compiler. They did not supply. They, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with the company. They did not supply demos uh, set up for that. I'm sure you could use it if you wanted to. Um, the uh, eval boards that they s supply, I mentioned the one that I got. Uh, the, the first one is a fairly large board that is very well equipped for, for you know evaluation, and that sells for about $300. They have a little starter kit board that's about $70. And these both, OK, so these chips don't use JTAG for programming. They, they use a ARM. Uh, debug interface that's designed to need lo less pins for, for the debug interface called uh, SWD for serial wire debug. And so not all of the ARM development tools uh, that you might have support that. The Sager J-Link does. And these eval boards from Energy Micro have an OEM Sager J-Link on them. So when you buy one of those eval boards, including that $70 one, then that gets you what you need to program the chip. Um, and you can do it directly from that IAR or uh, IDE. Uh, you can do the programming and debugging, whatever from that. Energy Micro supplies a few tools also to do things like uh, energy profiling and uh, programming the chip. You can use the Eclipse IDE. Um, I want to, I, I'm likely going to switch to using the new compiler and tools, but haven't done that yet. Um, so the original plan, I, I mentioned I started writing little test programs and the intent was that once I was happy with the test programs that you know I understood how the chip worked and everything that I would just you know then I would throw those away and start writing uh, the the calculator firmware and you know best laid plans of mice and men well you know gee I can add this feature just to this little test program and I can add a few more features and I can add the, some of the calculator simulation and pretty soon pretty soon this amalgamation of test programs has evolved into the calculator and the problem that results in is a lot of that early test code I wrote for managing things like the power modes and the oscillator and so forth. You know, really were since they were only written as tests. We're, we're not really uh, general enough, and we're not thought out well enough to such, such that that's resulted in there being some bugs that were really difficult to track down. But I think I've got a handle on all that now. I uh, was calling some of my functions from from an interrupt handler, and they they you know weren't protected against mutual exclusion, and and so I spent about a week trying to track down a really nasty program there where it would crash uh, with probability about three percent when I would push a key. So, you said crash and it shut down. Oh, okay. Well, I don't really have anything more to sh more to show here, so that's why. Well, actually, no. I do have one more thing. I'm gonna sh I'm gonna show when we when we. So I mentioned we only got this display relatively recently, and you know we ordered it, and the specs all sounded good, but we weren't really sure whether we wanted to use it. So rather than make another printed circuit board using that display, the first thing we did was actually to um, clue it on to. Uh, to, to the calculator by plugging it into the SD slot. <laughs> and uh, I, I could power this up, but I don't think I'm going to bother. This is very fragile. Uh, it's broken several times because it is all just clued together. But that let us evaluate the LCD and become convinced that we really liked it. Um, so we, re we really we really like the contrast ratio on this display. It's uh, better than the character LCD we were using before. It's maybe not quite as good a contrast ratio as the original 41 display, but it, you know it's readable, readable in bright sunlight. Um, it's readable from a wide range of viewing angles. It doesn't have weird effects when you when you uh, uh, look at it at a fairly sharp angle. Here, here the the main problem we have with seeing it is actually due to the the uh, mylar case, not not the display. 
You don't but, get any nice rainbow effects. Uh, with this miler, we don't. Um, I'm, I'm, when we make a, when we make a real case, I, I need to figure out what kind of plastic we need to use to not have rainbow effects. I think polycarbonate, uh, which is what I would be inclined to use, probably would have rainbowing. Although it might not with this display, since the display technology is different. I, I, that's something we have to evaluate. The, simulate, the, the actual calculator simulation code in here, um, I originally wrote code to simulate the HP 4555 and 80 back in 1995, then I did the 41C a little after that. And this is actually, uh, for various reasons, I went back to a very early version of my 41 simulation code. Um, the time, uh, so it, do, it does, uh, you can see the stopwatch running here. It's simulating the time module. The difficult part about simulating the time module is the accuracy factor. And we considered leaving that out entirely. I ended up coming up with a way to implement the accuracy factor so that it performs uh, long term identically to what the 41 did, which in the, on the 41 in the time module or in the CX, the accuracy factor controlled how often it would add or delete a, a clock pulse from the internal time base, which ran at uh, effectively 10.24 uh, kilohertz. And there's no way I can do anything similar to that. So what I'm doing is, is I'm doing timekeeping in units of, of uh, nanoseconds, and I'm getting interrupts at 100 hertz, and so every 100 times a second when I get that interrupt, uh, I add some value to the clock in nanoseconds that's been computed from the accuracy factor to match what the effect of the 41 time base with accuracy factor would be. So short, short term it's not, it's not as accurate, but long term it's, it's identical. Um, what, you don't, what you won't see here, this version here, I'll turn it over, you can see the bottom. It looks very similar to some of the ones we've done before. Um, you can see right here is a footprint for an SD uh, card slot, which because we've got this display sticking out up here, um, we, just, we didn't bother to load the SD socket. We had that on the earlier prototypes. What we're going to do is move to a micro SD and it obviously will be externally accessible. Um, so we have an extra memory chip in here that is a uh, ferroelectric RAM or FRAM. Uh, that's a little serial memory chip, 128k bytes, and the intent was to have some mass storage built into the calculator. So you know, <coughs> instead of just the, uh, um, what, three, 320 registers, about 2100 bytes of program memory that 41 has that you would actually be able to save and load programs from a different, you know, from different internal uh, memory location or the SD card. Um, we're actually using the, it doesn't matter on the internal memory since it's not removable, but we're using the FAT file system. Um, I've got the file system code working on here so that from a test program I can load and, you know, I can, I can access files, read and write, but we don't yet have a type in 41. And so the question was, how to do that, and I decided that probably the best thing to do will be to write a replacement for the HPIL control uh, or the HPIL module mass storage functions, so it'll look very similar to a 41 with HPIL, except that um, pretty much only the mass storage functions will be implemented, and a subset of the other functions we've got a we've got a serial port, and so I thought, well, if we did the HPIL functions to access that serial port, that might be useful also. Um, We'll probably, as I mentioned, we'll probably add a function to let you control the clock speed. Uh, there'll be just certain discrete speeds you can select. Uh, Richard mentioned uh, wanting a variable tone function, and that is that is something we anticipated on this. It will be very easy to do on this. Uh, when when the simulated calculator goes to produce a tone, what I'm doing is, is, inter, you know, is trapping that it got to the location in the ROMs that generates tones, and then I actually generate the tones in ARM code. And um, so, if you know, by adding a microcode function that talks to that, I could you know make the tone capability uh, within the limits of this little uh, resonator in here, uh, make the tone capability very general. So compatibility, this this will, this should run all 41 user code that doesn't require uh, special peripherals or the like. It does support synthetic programming. Most my I, I have uh, built into the the load image at the moment the. Um, uh, advanced fun the well, no the, yeah well it's running the 41 CX so it has the extended functions built in I've I've got in the load module the um, um, advantage. What was it? advantage ROM that's thank you um, and in principle you could use almost any other plug-in ROM whether it's user code or microcode or a combination of the two so you are doing that emulation in there it's yes like yes well. I call it a simulator. The definitions uh, seem to have changed over time. I'm going by the original definitions IBM had back in 1963. Um, so, 
things that wouldn't work are the card reader ROM, the wander printer ROM, the plotter ROM, extended IO, HPL development, things like that. But you know, anything that didn't require special hardware should work. Um, we had a fair bit of trouble at various times with this because the vendor supplied debug tools appeared to be not very robust. And I just had a meeting that actually worked, so I'm a little bit happier with the tools now. Um, so for a calculator, uh, if it's running on disposable batteries, you really want the batteries to last quite a while. And this has been one of the challenges facing us. So it's, it's, it's difficult to do that. Um, we started out using lithium coin cells and Richard came up with the objective that, that we would like the batteries to last a year under typical usage. And we came up with a model for what we thought constitute typical usage. That model probably would not be valid for most people in this room. The, um, so what he did was he, he specified the largest lithium coin cells he could fit in here. Now, you all are used to devices that take CR2032s. So that's probably the most common lithium coin cell size. He found, he found CR2450s, so that's five millimeters tall by, 20, by uh, uh, 24 millimeter diameter, I think, if I remember how those work. And they have about double the energy storage of a 2032, and he designed two of those in here. The problem with them is that they cost way more than double what a 2032 cell costs. And so if we use coin cells, we really want to use 2032s. And using this energy microchip, we've reduced the power consumption enough that we can, that we can do that reasonably. Um, so I'll tell you what the power consumption is later. It's later in my notes here. But it's basically, um, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you in terms of, of the current drawn, which is about 15 microamps in powered off mode. This is. This number is higher than we want it, but it seems to be within reasonable bounds for, for what would provide an acceptable battery life. Uh, about 100 microamps turned on, but idle. So if it's just sitting there with the display on, it's about 100 microamps. And actually running at 14 megahertz, it's drawing about seven milliamps. So uh, we, believe, we believe that, uh, I'm not gonna go into details on our, on our expected usage model, but we believe the battery life would, be, would in fact be over a year uh, with, with our standard model. Um, one of the problems with doing a simulation when it's running fast is that there are things in the original in the original microcode that then run unacceptably fast. There are timing loops. For instance, you may remember on 41, when you when you press a button for a function, let me get out of the stopwatch. Yeah, we you you press a key for a function that doesn't prompt like your cosine, and if you hold it, it nulls out. That's the intent of that, I believe, was that when you're in user mode and you may have reassigned the keys, you may forget what they are, and therefore you can push the key, and if you see that it's not what you thought it was, then you just hold it and, and, not, and nothing happens. And so if you don't do something special for that, then it just nulls instantly. And at first that was happening so fast that we, that we couldn't figure out what was going wrong. Why, why, you know, we pushed the button and we weren't holding it, but it was already nulled. You know, it's like, why, why did cosine not do anything? You know, the cosine of 17 isn't 17. Um, and similarly, the tone, the, the tone and beep functions, before we intercepted them, the, you know, the, those ran the loops too fast. Pause, catalog, EMDR, alarm cat, anything like that, you know, ran, ran too fast. Actually, alarm cat still does because I haven't fixed that one yet. And the way we dealt with that is we added an extra bit to the ROM. So our ROM images, instead of being 10 bits wide, actually we added two bits. They're actually 12 bits wide. In fact, right now I'm not, I'm not storing them for maximum space efficiency, so they're actually 16 bits wide, but I'm only using two extra bits. One of those extra bits tells it to slow down. If it, if it executes an instruction that does not have that bit set and then the next instruction does, then it slows down to one megahertz and it'll stay at one megahertz until it hits an instruction that the slow bit is not set, and we'll switch back to the 14. And it turned out, um, and I, I suppose this is not too amazing, but it turned out that this is exactly what Monty did on the 41CL. He added a bit to the ROM to slow it down, and so he was kind enough actually to send me uh, information on, on which ROM words he had already put the slow down bit in on the 41CL, and I put those in this, and it worked beautifully. And then I found a few more, like, I'm a little bit surprised, but he, hadn't, he actually had not found the loop that does that null, and so I sent that to him. Um, there's still a few more to be to be had, like as I mentioned, the alarm cat. Um, the the running it fast um, has interesting other effects on the behavior, like the flying goose when a program is running, especially if the program's in a tight loop, and so that goose is moving pretty fast, and then you crank up the speed even more because you're simulating it much faster, you know, say seven times or something. Uh, 
On the original 41, when they wanted to move that goose one position, all they did was execute one instruction that told the hardware shift the whole display one one character position. That was all they did. So one instruction executed standard instruction time. On all of our calculators, when that instruction is executed to shift the display one position, we have to rewrite the entire display to make that happen. And so just the flying goose slows down the display quite a bit. And this is true on the 41 CLs also. So if you do a view or an A view of something before executing the loop, then it'll run faster because it, then it doesn't uh, do the rotation. Um, running it faster obviously has implications on battery life. I mentioned that you know we're drawing somewhere around seven or eight milliamps when it's running. Uh, if we ran at a lower speed, then we would draw less current. Um, this is a problem when if a program unexpectedly goes into an infinite loop. And so the program's sitting there doing something, and you think it's doing something useful due to a bug in the program. Actually, it's just going to sit there looping forever and not accomplishing anything useful. And so it's just going to suck down the battery that much faster than if it was running at a lower rate. Um, is, that a, is that a problem? Well, prob I don't think so. You just have to be a little bit more careful as a user, I suppose. I mean, there's not any way that I can really solve that problem. Um, well, I should be careful here. Um, uh, there, there is kind of a solution, which is that it could decide if it's been running a while at 14 megahertz and, and it doesn't you know, seem to be making any demonstrable progress uh, or detectable progress towards you know, being done with the computation, then it, could, then it could decide to slow down. And that's what I believe what Cyril has done in, in some calculators. Um, I often try to decide just after two seconds, after two seconds on the 30 bit, actually the crazy speed 10 megahertz. The reason is different is because I'm running at 20 mega, uh, sorry, at 36 mega, I'm running around 20 mega, which starts to be a large draw on the CR 2032. Which are and rated for about 4 milliamps each, I believe. Yeah, a little bit Peak. On that, but yeah. So it's way, way above the spec of the battery, uh, which is why I need spreading for more than a couple of seconds. I don't want to kill the battery, so I drop the speed right. to avoid that. That seems like a reasonable thing to do, but I, uh, right now I don't have any plan to do that in, yeah, in our calculator. Like some other people who have the timing on the contest don't do that on their version of the machine, so it's not very fair. <laughs> so the other, the other thing that we have problem with the coin cells, and this is true whether we use the 2032 or use the, the larger uh, um, uh, 2450, is we have this SD card slot like, like the 50 has, the 50G has, and SD cards are specified to draw up to 100 milliamps when you're accessing them. And that is way, way beyond what these coin cells are rated for. What we find is it works if it's a fresh coin cell. We haven't tried it on a nearly depleted coin cell, but it'll probably fail. And so we really are probably going to have to move to AAA cells like what the you know, 49 and 50 and, and such use. And before we had the problem uh, with with you know with these calculators of well if you, if we put a triple if we put a, put a pair of triple A's in here somewhere we're gonna have to make the calculator thicker there's you know kind of no two ways about it there isn't any extra room in there for for a triple A cell or two but on on this model where we've got this uh, uh, display the display is really thin and it's up at the top end of the calculator and we don't really need to have any electronics or anything else up there so I think we actually have room that we can put triple A's there. And what we can probably do is make the calculator a lot thinner down at the bottom end and, and a little bit <coughs> only slightly thicker at the top end, have a classic sort of wedge shape and, and fit the triple A's in. And that's good because the triple A's have twice the energy storage of CR2032's, um, so the batteries will last even longer and be easier to replace. We were worried a little bit that if we put triple A's up at that end of the calculator that, you know, well, gee, is that going to feel balanced appropriately in your hand? But then I thought, well, you know, that 41 with the card reader has a lot of weight up there at that end, and nobody complained too bitterly about that, so maybe that's okay. Um, I'm almost done here. I've got, I'm going to talk just a little bit about, about the future. So we're already planning. Um, this, this calculator has this display. It actually still has the original printed circuit board, but then it has an extra printed circuit board that adapts the, uh, the connector that was for the character LCD to, to the... Um, to the sharp memory LCD. We're planning on, on, on a new revision. We're going to make some changes, and it's it's only going to be intended for the sharp display. Uh, well, I guess I'll mention one other problem with the sharp display is it's expensive. We don't have a volume quote on it yet, but quantity one buying it from a distributor like Mauser, it costs $45. Uh, we, we are, it, the quantity pricing, we have reason to believe that in moderate quantities it can be gotten for under $15, and we're, we're really depending on that. Uh, if that. If that doesn't turn out to be true, then 
we probably won't be able to use the display. <laughs> what are they marketing that display for? I really don't know. And these displays come in a, in a range of different sizes, all the way up to a six inch. Um, they're little tiny ones. Uh, there, there's, there are people actually making watches that use the little tiny ones. And the tiny ones are interesting. They use a little bit different technology. I mean, they're, they're the memory, they're the thin film transistor memory LCD, but they don't use polarizers. And the technology that's used, I don't fully understand, but results in, instead of looking like a black on white display, it looks like a mirror finish for the active pixels and kind of a frosted glass finish for the ones that are not active. It's a real interesting appearance. I don't know that you would want it for a calculator, but they don't make that in this size anyhow. Um, so for the future, yes, we're going to do a new print circuit board that's designed for this display from the outset. We're going to use a newer version of this microcontroller. I mentioned this is the, Je the Gecko. They have announced and are currently sampling, but not yet in production, of a newer giant gecko part. And the interesting characteristic of the giant gecko, it has eight times the memory, which means it has a megabyte of flash and 128 kbytes of RAM. That eases up our memory pressure tremendously and allows for having, for instance, a whole lot of ROM images loaded like you can on, like, well, like the 41CL comes with a whole bunch of ROM images already in it. We'll be able to do something similar. Um, we have various plans for how we could take advantage of the extra RAM. Right now, right now, we only have a couple hundred bytes out of our 16K bytes are, are left over. Um, it also has a USB interface. It's not, it's not high-speed USB, but for a calculator, having just uh, the standard speed, to uh, full speed, 12 megabits probably is adequate because that would let you hook it up to your PC and load programs in and out of it and so forth. Um, it runs because partially because it has the USB, it, it can run at a higher clock rate, up to 48 megahertz. Um, and I, I forgot to mention, by the way, on the code optimization that I said would speed this up a lot, another thing we can do, and this ties in with having the more RAM, is we can move the core of our simulation code into RAM, and the RAM runs at full speed even up to the 48 megahertz, no, no, no wait states. So that's a way that we could actually get useful benefit out, out of the higher clock rates, whereas right now, going from the 14 to 28 doesn't seem worthwhile since it's only 50% better performance. Um, we haven't yet decided, if we, if we put USB in the calculator, do we need, still need a serial port? And this was obviously something that HP um, on the uh, 49G uh, and G Plus uh, um, did not think that that was necessary. And I don't know if it was just due to feedback from customers or, or why, but on the 50G, the serial port returned and is there in addition to the, to the USB. Will our customers, if, assuming, we, assuming we decide to sell, you know, to sell this thing and, and can make it economically viable, will our customers demand a serial port? I don't know. Yes. <laughs> well, the, the, this crowd, I would expect to say yes. The question is, are average customers? Will we have average customers? Maybe, the, maybe this room contains all of our customers. Um, we're going to use a micro SD card instead of SD. And you know, you know, when when flash memory cards came out, and uh, you know, they had the the PCMCIA ones, which seemed remarkably small at the time, and then they came out compact flashes. Wow, those are really small. And, and after a while, you get used to that. And then the PCMCIA cards, geez, those things were huge. And then they came out with you know, various other ones, you end up with SD, and so SD, wow, those compact flash cards were, were really huge. And then they come up with micro SD, and now I look at SD cards, and I'm like, well, why were those so big? Um, and uh, so it'll be interesting to see whether... Oh, I already told you about the new Nano SD earlier. Yeah, well, it'll be interesting to see whether the new Nano or Pico SD, and you have to be care you know, careful not to sneeze and whatever, but um, the... Uh, so we're going to use micro SD instead. We haven't decided, uh, you know, I mentioned we have the internal non-volatile memory now with some FRAM. We haven't decided whether whether to keep that or go to flash or phase change memory, both of which would allow us to have more memory built in, or maybe just put a second micro SD slot that's inside the battery compartment or something, so you can, you know, stick a card in and just keep it there. Um, one of the one of the big changes we're making is we've decided that we're going to we're probably going to split the PC board and all the all the prototypes to date, inclu including the uh, mm -hmm. including the one I'm showing here, the DIY4. Um, we have a single PC board that has a keyboard, has electronics, has everything on it. Um, we decided that we're going to split that and put essentially all the active electronics on one fairly small board, same outline as the display, and then have a separate keyboard uh, board. And what that does is it gives us some some better packaging flexibility that the keyboard and display don't have to be in the same physical plane. They'll just have to be a, conne a connector with some flex circuit between them. That increases the cost slightly. But it also means we can put different keyboards on it. And so, for example, we could put a keyboard that has the layout of the Pioneer calculators, like 42S, 
uh, the 20B, 30B, you know, layout, which is essentially the same. Yes. And that would allow, you know, that would, that would allow us then to, to support, you know, different firmware on this because as much as I enjoy writing simulators for the 41 and the like, uh, this hardware platform I think has a lot of potential. And just like HP has has leveraged the, the platform based on the Atmel chip into a variety of calculators, we would like to do the same thing, except that I don't want to write all the firmware for all those calculators. And so uh, I've actually talked to the WP34S uh, team, and they expressed a great deal of interest in it. And it was interesting because I had suggested, you know, maybe the, just the 34S firmware could be adapted to run on this hardware platform and you'd get some benefits. And actually, uh, they were they were more interested in basically doing a ground up uh, rewrite to fully take advantage of the hardware and you know so I would love to be able to provide this and basically what I've said is that when we have uh, prototypes of this next version that we would be delighted to make them available to the 34s team to work on um, well, the, yeah, that would be great um, uh, another <coughs> I, I have no intention of doing that, and I will, I will certainly do everything I can to discourage that. We are, we are not, we are not attempting, uh, have no interest in trying to take away any business from HP. Um, what is the keyboard technology? Oh, so the the keyboard technology we're using now is just uh, uh, commonly available tap switches, and so these are sealed switches, but that contain a, a snap dome, like a traditional. Thank you, like a traditional uh, <laughs> HP. Uh, keyboard. Um, we've looked at we've looked at using individual snap disks. Uh, one of the companies that makes these is called Snaptron, um, and we got a quote from them recently. And the quote uh, in quantity ten thousand is that the domes actually cost more than the encapsulated uh, tack switch we yeah. use now. So that's not looking very appealing. Um, the the last the last uh, topic I've got is production or how to make a, a small fortune, which is of course by starting from a large fortune. Uh, we have issues with component costs, like the chart memory LCD I mentioned is expensive. If we wanted to sell this as a product, we've got a bunch of NRE, which is non-recurring engineering costs that we would need to deal with. Uh, we we need a real industrial design. You know, I mentioned that you know I've tried doing some stuff, you know, print, print stuff with the uh, 3D printer. 3D printing is great for prototyping, but it's too expensive to use for production. And the quality, although it's amazing for what you know for what you can do on your desktop, it's it's not up to the quality you get with injection molding. Um, the the industrial design, my own skills with SolidWorks are probably not up to making something really nice looking. Um, so we'll probably have to pay an industrial designer. Um, then we need tooling for injection molding. That's pretty expensive. I might be able to CNC mill uh, molds myself, uh, which would save a lot of money. But uh, the results. I, I don't know how good the results will be. Uh, we need to do FCC testing if we want to sell it. Um, it has to be you know, compliant with the FCC rules for RFI. It has to be submitted to an independent testing lab. That costs upwards of $5,000. So then there's the question, how do we raise funding to do all this? Yeah, that was green. I assume you want red. So I'll wrap this up. I'll, I, I promise you I'll wrap this up very quickly. Uh, one, one idea we've had for raising funding that we haven't done yet is Kickstarter. I don't know if, how many of you have seen that, but it's a website for funding projects. If you have a, a good project plan and for a piece of hardware that usually wants to see a prototype, which fortunately we have, then you can put up a proposal and you can say, well, we want to raise X dollars to do this, that, and the other thing and produce such and such. And you set out a timeline and what you do is you set, is you set up some rewards. You say, well, you know, if somebody donates a dollar, we'll send them a nice thank you postcard. But if they, you know, if they donate $25, we'll send them a t-shirt. And if they donate some much larger amount of money, then they'll get an actual calculator when we have it made. So we could try funding it on Kickstart, Kickstarter. If we actually make a product, then how do we market it? You know, it's presumably a, low, a relatively low volume niche product where, you know, I don't think we're going to be, going to be competing with HP or TI or Casio or anybody like that. Do we just sell it by direct sales? Um, because our volumes probably will be low, it's going to be an expensive product. You know, if you if you think you're going to be able to go and buy this, uh, you know, for what an HP 50G costs, um, no, that's probably not going to happen. And I'm sorry. And would people, you know, would people pay for an expensive calculator when they can, in fact, buy a 50G for I don't know what they sell for now, but not very much. Um, so I think it's. The, the odds of this being a successful commercial product are probably fairly low, but you know, I mean, the, the nice thing about it is we've had a lot of fun doing it. Mm -hmm.